they'll still be available and you still do the candidate forums on Zoom because there's some people are going to go, fine, the governor said it's okay, but I'm not going out into a group right now, or I'm not going to go stand in line to, uh, to vote in an election, um, even if you provide six feet distancing. And you really don't know whether all the poll workers are going to work either. So uh, yeah. I would be prepared to, to, even if the order comes off, the ability to still do things remotely is still there for anything for a while. So, so Fred, um, I agree. However, um, once the order comes down, we need 21 votes in the in the House or more, and 11 or more in the Senate. While the order's up, we need a vote of one, which is Governor Carney. So um, it's much easier to keep the rule there under a state of emergency than it is afterwards. Um, we need to make steps in the General Assembly uh, to remove the requirement of the excuse. Uh, and you know, I personally am hopeful we can get there and we've got efforts underway, but it's not a done deal yet. My suggestion, Paul, would be to talk to the governor and say, okay, if you're ready to take the state of emergency off, take it off slowly and maybe you let restaurants open, but allow people to still absentee ballot <laughs> because people Very can good. say, you know, oh yeah, the restaurant's open, but I'm not, I'm going to still do takeout. So let them still do takeout on a vote. So. That's a good suggestion. Good. Yeah. Fred, Fred does have a valid point about poll workers. Um, I have a friend who's a poll worker in Florida and they were down in their election, um, believe it or not in Florida where, you know, people were on the beach and everything, but, um, and, and we know that um, that recent election in Wisconsin, I guess it was, you know, they just yeah. didn't have the poll workers. They're yeah. usually elderly people, older people like me or older. Um, and I think you're right. I think a lot of people are going to be sort of, uh, I guess to use a, a, for lack of a better term, a little bit gun shy about going out where there are going to be a lot of people. Yeah. In fact, on the absentee ballot, I think once it opens up, I would be inclined if I'm going to do that to do it as soon as I could and vote in case the restriction comes off between when I vote and later. So yeah, the actual get, get your absentee requests in ASAP, I guess is yeah. the message there. So yeah. that's for elections. But for those of you who follow the news, you know, we have two other seats that have to be filled Two board members step down um, in the last couple of months, the uh, district F filing, or in, uh, letters of interest has closed. There are three candidates, one of whom we have here tonight, maybe more, I don't know, because I don't know all the names. I know that Navid has put his name forward. Um, if you look at the board calendar, they have a lot of meetings scheduled. Next Tuesday is a regular business meeting and Wednesday is the meeting where they will be interviewing the candidates for that um, board seat. So if you're interested in knowing who has put themselves forward for that, um, tune in then. Um, and then the other seat is District B, which is the northern part of the district, the kind of Pike Creek area, um, and a little bit in, and down. It's the district that borders Fred's district. That seat, the uh, applications for that are, are open until May 4th, I believe. So um, the instructions on how to apply are on the district website. Not only have we been having increased voter turnout for school board elections, we have been blessed to have more people come forward to be on the school board, which is beyond exciting. So it, these are all signs that Christina is really headed in a, in a new and I think exciting direction. So that's open until the fourth. Um, I know that there's one person who put her name forward um, and I don't know if there are others, but um, you can spread the word on that. Any questions about board vacancies, elections, openings before, Alva, you're still here. Are you with us? I'm hoping Alva Mobley, the district's PIO, can give us an update on the referendum if there are no more questions about the uh, school board. Actually, Mary, if I can jump I in can, real quick. No. I'm yep. sorry. Yeah, Mike um, and then Lynette. Okay, I just thought I'd let you know I'm the other person who's running for the district D. Yay. <laughs> okay. So, yes, so that I am, the what another one of the three okay do you want to just quick introduce yourself well sure um i've been a teacher in the district for i was for 23 years and i retired and um i've lived in the district since 
1977. I am extremely passionate about the district and I just, I wanted to be involved more and more and this position came up. So I'm just, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to interview and for the board to find out a little bit about me because um, I, I just want to help it out. I feel a teacher's viewpoint is probably um, important and that's one part of it that's sort of missing and I just feel like I need to be a spokesman for the teachers. So that's my purpose. Awesome. Thank you, Lynette. You're nice welcome. To meet you. Mike, you wanted to say something. Sure, real quick. Uh, hey, Lynette, good luck to you. Um, Susan, I was going to say to um, connect with Yvonne. I know she's working on some forums uh, through the PTA, but it sounds like I, I just got an update <laughs> on a text. Uh, sounds like you're already speaking with her on some things, so. Okay, uh, yeah, we have in the past, and I'm gonna do a little bit of a commercial here about that absentee ballot form. I was here too. Um, because uh, Fred's right about, you know, get it done right away. Um, if you visit the Newark Delaware NAACP website, there's actually, you can click on a link and you will get the form that all you have to do is start typing your information in, print it, sign it, and send it. Susan, I also posted the link in the chat section here. Okay. And that link um, has also been the is that to the, um, is that, that's the one to the state, the yeah. I vote? No, I posted, I posted the link to the form, mm -hmm. the ballot for the school board election. Awesome. Oh, for the school board election. The school okay. board election. Yeah, I was talking about for the other elections, the party elections, so. Yeah, so the link has uh, already been shared now on uh, focused uh, Facebook page as well. Okay, okay awesome. So, um, Seeing that we continue to have so many wonderful candidates come forward with an interest in being on the school board, I'm going to make a plug to our legislators right now to think about changing the nominating district restrictions and uh, Christina for one, but it would have to be because it's only the five Newcastle County districts that have these very restrictive nominating districts and no at large seats. I would love to see five nominating districts and two at-large seats. I've talked to people in other districts who think that that's also a good idea, but that gives more, we have, we, we're getting more and more really good candidates who have to wait one for five years to try to get back on the board again. But if there were two at-large seats, the opportunity would be a little bit more frequent. So that's my plug to our legislators right there. So I know you've heard me say it before, but I'm saying it to everybody here. All right. Let's move on from the board and Alva, if you are ready, can you give us an update on the referendum campaign? Oh, I wonder if she stepped away. <laughs> uh, maybe she's Alva. Will... She's at least oh, she's muted. I know, and, and her um, her picture's up. So. Um, yeah, this is Fred. I can give you something. Not you, moving, you know. Give us an update, Fred, and then Alva can jump in when she um, comes back. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it very simple. Um, Alva's got a very aggressive, detailed plan, and the communications will start going out tomorrow. And there'll be communications from uh, Superintendent Mr. Gregg, uh, Dr. Meredith Griffin, the uh, board president, principals, teachers, and there's a whole plan to communicate with parents as we go forward on that. And there's also a plan, and I won't try to get into the details, to communicate through social media and with businesses and through radio stations and eventually to put signs up in businesses as best we can. And, you know, so it, it's about a two-page, two to three-page plan, and I won't try to go into all the details of that, but uh, it's uh, rather extensive. We, and in reality, it would have started a while ago, but I think the, uh, with the uh, coronavirus and the focus in the district on trying to make sure children were being educated remotely, took up everybody's time. And um, Tuesday night at the board meeting, we finished any discussions about changing the requested tax increase. I mean, that was had been discussed a week and a half ago, um, but we're gonna stick with the 29.5 and five on the operating budget plus the 
to five for elementary English language arts, uh, new curriculum, and no changes on the capital. Um, so it's now go forward and communicate and get the word out to everybody in short time frame. So. Could, here's a question for the legislators again. So, and I'm not an expert on understanding these things, but I know that the capital referendum is a match to a pool of money that's already been passed by the state or, or approved by the state. Is, is there any possibility that that could be impacted by the current budget situation? Well, Fred, this, or Mary, this is Fred. Yeah. The money that we're asking for will be the 40% to match the 60% from the state if it's the 60% approved in the bond bill this year. So the Department of Education said it's okay to spend the money on that. General Assembly has to approve it in the bond bill. So it's not necessarily approved as yet. Is that right? No. The, the process is the school district has to submit a certificate of necessity to the Department of Education, which we did, and that was approved for about 11 million out of the 100 million plus we asked for. And then we have to come up with our 40% through referendum. And then the General Assembly has to approve their 60% through the bond bill. And then the process can start to actually go do the work. Okay. So that, that's the main part. The second part is 100% um, funded by district funds for some other additional work we wanted to do, like upgrade the auditorium in Newark High School for Performing Arts Academy and uh, improvements and renovations to labs for med tech and ag sciences at, at uh, Christiana and additional classrooms for Chinese immersion at Downs. Uh, those didn't make the priority list from the State Department of Education. Statewide, the request from all the districts for capital money for deferred maintenance was over a billion dollars, and they approved about 10% of it. So uh, we got our share of that. Uh, but now it all depends on whether the General Assembly is going to have the money to float those bonds for that, too. So we'll see. Uh, this is Monica. If the General Assembly, because of what's happened, decides they're not going to float the bonds, does that mean we do not then put that part of the capital into a referendum? Like we were, the referendum authorizes us to set a tax rate yeah. or to set a tax rate to based on the expected bond. If the bond is not going to be purchased, then that tax rate wouldn't actually go into effect. Well, the, the way it works on capital, you're not approving a tax rate. You're approving the state, the district, to pay their carrying charges, interest, and principal on bonds that the state issues. That may not start for a couple of years till the bonds are actually okay. issued. And what the rate's going to be depends on what the interest rate is at the time when the bonds are issued. Okay. And, and the capital part to it, if both parts of that are approved, on the average taxpayer or average homeowner, property owner, it, I think it's like $3 a year increased taxes. So it's not a lot of money. So can I uh, say a little bit about that? Um, right now, interest rates are really low. And even with the, the declining uh, revenues, uh, it's highly likely we're going to have at least uh, using the 5% rule, 5% of the, the revenues, uh, we'll be able to uh, bond about $225 million. Um, and, and that's maintaining the 5% rule. And I can tell you that there is consideration uh, by uh, the budget office and others to uh, do a one-time deviation from the 5% rule um, there's other thing, tools in the box too that are potential. And the, and the main reason is if something is, uh, and I'll put in air quotes, shovel ready, um, construction is a very good uh, stimulus. Uh, and, and with so many people now out of work, uh, it's likely that there will be uh, interest in trying to do as much construction as we can possibly do and, uh, and I'm going to try to make sure that, uh, that we do fund anything that is passed by referendum and as much minor cap work as we can possibly um, uh, put out, put out uh, this year. Uh, the construction industry was going very strong prior to this. 
Uh, they are considered an essential business, but an awful lot of them have been shut down because of um, the entity they were building for decided to shut down the construction project. So uh, now's a good time to build for two reasons. We may be able to get very good bids and interest rates are very low. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, uh, Susan asked in the chat if uh, Friends of Christina is part of the referendum campaign and the, the planning. And yes, we are. We're, we're on Alva's team and we are um, working with her to make sure the message is, I keep telling her it needs to be lean and focused um, with the, not, no pun intended. Um, uh, because we have limited amount of time, we don't have the traditional um, mechanisms to get out and have conversations about this. So we are going to be challenged, but I think with, um, with good materials and good marketing um, uh, materials, especially uh, probably some videos and, and different kinds of things, we should be able to get some messages out. And I'm hopeful, and I know that the um, everybody in the district is hopeful that the community sees just how essential our schools are for our community and for the well-being of our families and for our students and just how hard our teachers work because um, they are, I know every single teacher is just really working double duty now, uh, retooling to make sure that everything that they were doing before can be accessible online and they are just reaching out and providing care and concern. Um, so I'm hoping we can use some of that messaging to really help people understand how important it is that the community rallies behind its schools and its school district. So, um, so be on the lookout, I guess, for some of that messaging. And, and this network, this group is what we are hoping is going to help us share the message about the referendum. Can Any I, questions? Can I, yeah. Can I comment on that? This is Helga. Yeah. Hi, Helga. Um, I, would, I'm not as optimistic as you are that the current situation is in our favor. I think there are a lot of people who are having personal financial concerns, which is going to make it harder to get them to agree to increase their taxes. So that, that's my big fear. Um, but what I wanted to put out there um, is that I think in our messaging, we need to make sure that the district comes across as more transparent and more responsive to the complaints that people have lodged in the past so that we don't just paper over them and say hey we're great and we're doing all these wonderful things which christina does do a lot of wonderful things that should be advertised um, but we also need to acknowledge that there are problems and that we are aware of the problems that we're dealing with the problems um, and then provide the data to to show or to explain why some of the things that people are saying are outrageous are actually quite justified so I just want to make sure that that's part of the messaging um, that we can answer those people's concerns. That's a great um, comment, Helga, and I agree with you. I, I, I have to remain optimistic, but I do completely agree that the financial difficulties that a lot of people are in right now is going to make this uh, referendum a challenge. And that's, we have no control over that. Um, and good comments about the uh, messaging and the transparency and the ability to, to or the, the willingness to accept and own some of the challenges. I do think that the changes that have been happening in the district, um, if anybody was at the board meeting on Tuesday, it was probably the most, the smoothest and most efficient board meeting I've been to in the district perhaps ever um, in, in my 10 years of, of attending board meetings. So the board is going in a really good direction. I think it's exciting that there's, um, that, that they're taking the mantle to put new leadership in place. So all of those things, I think, do work in the district's favor. So that, that is good. But we do, I mean, it's, it's, it's an uphill um, challenge for a lot of reasons, many of which are beyond our control. But there are messaging things that are in our control. And um, I take your point that we need to make sure that that's part of what we um, transmit to the public. Anybody yeah. else have any other comments? Sorry, just to, to respond quickly and all yeah. those positive things that you're mentioning, right? They should be part of that. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Improvements yeah. on the board and such. Yeah. 
Mary. And, and this is this is Fred Pulaski. Just along that lines, I would recommend, and we don't need to do it while we're on the call. <clears throat> somebody or start writing down what those specific issues are, so that you can develop answers for talking points. So everybody's got the answers to those, so that uh, people don't go, uh, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you. So, Mary, for from. For the Newark partnership, if we're wanting to push out some of this messaging, are these things that the the Friends of Christina School District are going to post on their Facebook page that we can then reshare, or do you have like a document of some sort that we can you can send to me so that we can put together our own like education messaging in our like newsletters and okay, Facebook cool. page and things of that sort? Yes, I think um, I think Alva is back, so I'm going to let her speak to that. But we, as soon as we get the sort of finalized messaging from the district, we'll be pushing it out and we'll we'll be sharing with everybody. Great. Um, yeah, yeah. Mary's absolutely Mary's absolutely correct. We're going to um, send. I'll be sending it directly to Mary, and she'll be pushing it out to you guys. There will be includes the talking points, um, everything that we'll be sharing on social media, and any videos will be sent real time to Mary and she'll be sending it out to you guys in her network to um, support that effort as well. Any other questions about referendum? So push out, well, push out to the networks about the absentee ballot. Um, Certainly, I hope that's something the teachers will be talking to their parents with, because I know that the teachers are really interacting a lot with, with parents and families right now. Um, um, I, think, I think Claire wants to respond to one of the questions, okay. uh, the uh, points that was made earlier. So, Claire. I just, I just dropped in the chat. Um, I think Helga raises some really important points and they're actually points that we've been hearing in our community meetings for the superintendent search, that everybody agrees with um, the board members, I would, I would, I'm speaking for myself here, but I, I feel an agreement among my colleagues that um, both tr transparency and more openness in communication are two key characteristics that we're looking for in a new superintendent. So the fact that we are on this precipice where we're transitioning to a new superintendent is kind of really exciting because it enables us to actually put those values in place going forward on July 1st and to say to the community that they can be part of that. So, thank you, Claire. That was good. Um, with that, as soon as we get uh, the final uh, talking points, we'll be pushing them out on the referendum. And uh, the other thing we were talking about was just to give a quick update on like, what's happening with all the, the transition to learning and living under COVID for uh, educational services. Uh, Superintendent Gray gave a really good update at the board meeting on Tuesday, and I got a couple of statistics. You all probably know that they're distributing meals because a lot of kids depend on our schools for their nutrition. So there are five meal distribution sites, and they've distributed over 53,000 meals since the, the shutdown, since schools were closed. Um, Weekly, they give out learning resource packets, and they've also upped their distribution of Chromebooks to try to make... Um, the materials, the educational materials is accessible to all of the students. Um, I don't know if, Alva, you have anything else you want to add to that list. I know you're part of the team that's keeping this whole thing going. Um, or if anybody else has anything to add about. Darren, I don't know if you have anything to add from a teacher's perspective. I know that when everybody, like, shuts down their, their, um, their video <laughs> cameras, they may or may not still be there. Yeah. <laughs> I've Thanks, got, Mary. Guilty, I've done that in a meeting as well. Alva, did you want to add anything? Very, yeah, we, I agree. We've been very successful at keeping the, um, the meals going for our kids, and we've actually extended it to pretty much um, other kids that live in the same communities that, you know, they may not be Christina students, but if they live in those communities, we've been able to provide food for them as well. And for families that's displaced on the weekends, we've been going to um, hotels and making sure wow. they can still get food on the weekend. Um, in addition to that, uh, we did a survey, we made calls, we had, we reached out to parents to find out who, which of our kids didn't have um, access to Chromebooks and made sure that every parent that needed one or every student that needed one, we were able to provide that as well. Um, we've also 
provided information to them, how they can, parents who did not have access to Wi-Fi or the internet, um, we gave them information on how to receive free internet, I mean, internet, internet, <laughs> sorry. Um, and definitely, um, we found out that the packets have been going over very well. People are, some parents are more comfortable with the learning packets than they are with the online learning. So we haven't skipped a beat. I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. Good. All right. Um, the only other thing on our agenda was COVID funding. I don't know who wants to take that one on. Um, there's a lot of discussions swirling around about how much money might be available to education and in specific, uh, specifically the Christina School District. I threw it out there, it's not my, my area of expertise. <laughs> this is Fred, I can give you a big picture numbers. What the numbers I've seen is that uh, the money that's coming to the state for education purposes as it's distributed Christina will give 5.8, 5.9 million dollars. The limitation on that is it can only be used for expenses dealing with COVID uh, issues. And so it can be used for cleaning schools, providing Chromebooks. Um, the question keeps coming up, well, can't we use it to offset costs if the referendum doesn't pass? pass and the answer is no. You know, it's very specific for COVID related expenses. So. So we're going to use it for all those things, you know. One uh, other expense. And that kind of stuff will go out, you know, could be covered by, but that's it. So it's limited. Go ahead, Dave. I, I, I expect that um, the effort that the district has made to deliver breakfast and lunch to students who are eligible is also incurring costs. And those, I believe, would also be eligible. Yeah. yeah so, so there's a lot of things to be covered by. The, the question I keep being asked is, well, could, if we don't use it for COVID, could we use it for, <clears throat> if the referendum doesn't pass, not having to reduce our budget? And the answer I've been told is no. It's for COVID-related expenses only. So. But it is a significant amount of money. Um, Delaware is receiving about $51 million uh, just for K-12 through education. Uh, of course, there are strings attached to it. Um, our share is probably around five million, but uh, but not all of that five million is going to come to Christina. Some of it is actually going to uh, other charters and uh, non-public schools that um, that also receive Title One funding. So, Navid's correct on that, but that's not that's not a lot of money. So. There are a number of waivers also. In addition to testing, um, there's waivers on the existing use of Title I money that could go into next year if you haven't spent it all already. That's and, uh, Thanks, so, so there's some flexibility there. Uh, I was on a conference call with the National Conference of State Legislatures earlier this week. And um, like our state, where the leadership of all four caucuses sent a letter to our congressional delegation requesting additional flexibility for the general money that comes to states for COVID-19. Um, all, all of the states that were represented on that conference call had similar uh, efforts with their congressional delegations. Um, Mitch McConnell said something today that I thought was very offensive about uh, well, maybe states should just go bankrupt um, rather than us bail them out. And, uh, and I think that, um, uh, that that hopefully there will be a lot of pushback on that statement. But um, I, I would hope that the feds would give us more flexibility for those funds uh, because there's a lot of very good potential uses of them. And I, I think education is one area, especially in light of all of the, um, you know, distance learning type of things that, that the districts are trying to do and, and some of the expenses that were incurred. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. Um... That's it for our agenda. Are there any other issues that people want to raise um, that we can chat about quickly before we head out? Susan. Just one uh, piece of information because I have a text message from Yvonne Johnson. Um, she has already met with uh, Kim Wells, who is the Vote 411 director for actually the State League um, and candidates 
you will be getting a save the date notice for uh, a candidates forum. They're, they're going out tomorrow, I guess. So be on the lookout. Okay, good. Thank you. Anybody else? Claire? Um, I just wanted to add, um, thank you, Susan. I actually received my invitation to the forum. So if I could let everybody know, it's been scheduled for June 1st at 7 p.m. And um, more details, including a Zoom invite, will be sent out later on. Um, so that is specific for the Christina School District. There are other candidate forums for other school districts that are being scheduled for that week. But it's June 1st at 7 p.m. I also wanted to speak to um, a point that was made, I think, by uh, Fred and Naveed that the uh, estimated $5.9 million in CARES uh, Act funding that's um, due to go to Christina is actually not going to be shared with charter schools. The charter schools are allocated in, uh, uh, the charter schools are allocated their own pot of money from um, the CARES Act according to how many Title I students they have. I was sent an Excel spreadsheet by uh, Representative Osniewski who has been communicating with me about some of my concerns on this issue. And um, I was kind of surprised to know that Christina is actually slated to get the bulk of the money, but that's because Christina has the greatest percentage of Title I students of any district in the state. Mm -hmm. So, so charters are not included, but are non-public schools included uh, in, that yeah, yeah, in the spreadsheet spread. that I in the spreadsheet that I was sent? Charters are included, and um, pub private schools are not included. So, for example, Newark Charter, Odyssey Charter, Charter School of Wilmington, um, Aspira Academy are all on the spreadsheet with their own separate allocations. Yeah, this is Fred. I think what Navid's talking about is that there is public school financing that goes through the Christina School District to private schools with children that have, and I probably don't have these words just right, special needs or handicap or something like that. So part of that uh, CARES money will flow to those students also, but it's a very, very small amount. Okay. I don't know that it will flow to that. Yeah, I, I've been told it will, but, it, but it's, you know, if we get 5.8 million, if you take that away, it won't change the 5.8. It also won't flow this year. It will not flow until next year. Well, whatever. I'm not sure when it will, but. Yeah, but. Well, I remember um, Bob, uh, he mentioned that we'll have the pleasure of administering those disbursements. So, so I may have misunderstood. Uh, yeah, I think there's a little bit of money, but I, from a big picture viewpoint, if we're going to get 5.8, it's, you know, if, if you round the number to 5.8 million, it's not going to change. Okay. Okay, true. But my question then following that is, from an expense standpoint, when we figure out what the charter choice per student allocation is based on a previous year's expenses, are these going to be included or excluded? So that's I why I brought it up is because generally whenever we take in local tax monies, um, Christina kind of serves as a, as a bank account with transactions in, transactions out. And it looks like from the allocations on this spreadsheet, each district is allocated separately as our charter schools, which really caught my eye. So I just wanted to make sure to share that with the community. Yeah. We'll need to keep that in mind then when they're figuring out the charter choice payments that this should be excluded. And that's something that Bob Silber was very much on top of talking about why things are excluded and a new CFO so, with a lot of history and a lot of things to pick so up. This, um, I, I don't know if you folks know who I am. I, I run payroll and benefits and we're coding all of the expenses directly related to COVID uniquely, both in the payroll, the labor side and the non-labor side. <clears throat> so that when the time comes to do the building, we'll be able to extract that from that and not include that in that. Um, I've done tuition billing before Bob Silver joined us, so I'll probably support the new CFO in that role when we do this going forward. So um, that's awesome to hear. Good to meet you. Accounting is already distinguished that way. Okay. Uh, thank thanks, you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Okay. I understand Pam uh, has been trying to send a few questions. Uh, Pam, are you still here? Pam. Okay, she may have left. And I understand she was trying to uh, ask a few questions uh, she wasn't able to earlier. Okay. 
Any other questions, issues, concern before we end our conversation? Um, I know that the board has upped its meeting schedule. I don't know that we will. I'm looking at my calendar here. Um, we probably don't need a, a, a next meeting on, until maybe the end of or fourth week in May, which takes it to the 21st. But um, we will be reaching out to everybody with our uh, ask of spreading the news about the referendum and that campaign. So maybe we won't have a formal meeting, but we will be reaching out. And, and so hopefully that discussion will continue to be lively over the next couple of weeks. And then what is, are we six weeks out from the June 9th? I don't know, one day blends into the next, but um, <clears throat> that's our next task. So the board has moved forward with getting uh, some administration in place and we are now um, tasked with helping them in, in getting this referendum passed. So this has been a great turnout. I wanna thank everybody for, for showing up and for coming and um, for jumping in. And I know you're gonna to continue to jump in and support the district. Navi? Sure, uh, we had about 40 people uh, in the meeting at one point. Uh, they've started to leave uh, in five minutes. But thank you very much, everyone. You know, this participation is, uh, is key to the, to the success of the school district. And we hope uh, that we'll continue to have your eyes and ears uh, going forward as well. Thank you very much. Stay safe, everybody. Be well. Thank you, Mary and Naveed. Okay. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye.